Okay, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation, um, as well as to you for sticking it out ahead of lunch. Uh, so, uh, as Cecilia mentioned, I'm, I'm an associate professor of chemical engineering at MIT. Um, and by way of introduction, uh, since th there are a lot of people who are unfamiliar here to me, and so I'm sure my name and face are unfamiliar to you as well, is um, I'm a computational chemist by training, and if you had asked me when I started my independent career five years ago, what would I be talking to you about today? It would probably be something like this, hemoglobin. Um, and where I started my career was a lot thinking about um, how we could start to apply large-scale electronic structure, specifically DFT, uh, and it's now becoming increasingly possible to simulate uh, thousands of atoms with, with approximate um, quantum mechanical methods and understand why hemoglobin is responsible for all of us breathing triplet oxygen today. Um, uh, but I'm not going to tell you about that. I'm going to tell you about something a little closer to that, specifically the porphyrin or the heme under the hood. Uh, that, is, um, that is what makes hemoglobin work. It took nature millions of years to settle upon this particular structure as being essential for O2 binding. Um, and what I'd say is that similar to the fact that we can increasingly apply large-scale electronic structure, either to data generation for machine learning models or to understanding systems, is if someone gives us this structure and tells us it's the right answer, we can understand why it works. Um, so where I started my independent career uh, as a computational chemist interested in engineering and materials applications was trying to figure out how do we go beyond just understanding structures when someone hands it to us to understanding why certain atoms or bonds matter for distinct properties. Uh, as well as specifically how would we be able to predict those from scratch and how do we build a language that explains what this porphyrin is doing because its uh, metal center has numerous accessible spin states that are all governed by quantum mechanics and this is an area where phenomenological rules don't tend to work well and our electronic structure, our physics-based models also tend not to work well. Um, and that's what I'll tell you about today. Um, and my my slide advancer doesn't really like me. Um, so, so what I describe having a language for molecules is something that had already existed. And when we first got into this about, about five, six years ago, we looked at what was hanging around. And what I described just sounds like cheminformatics, right? And so cheminformatics is handy things like smile strings that have already been alluded to, the existence of empirical potentials, uh, multi-million molecule-sized databases of these different smile strings, and concepts of molecular similarity. So these already existed in the 80s and 90s in the cheminformatics community. And um, all I wanted to do, I want to really emphasize, is that I didn't think about this in the context of machine learning or deep learning, but uh, this is where the motivation came from, was just how do we make any of these things work for open shell transition metal chemistry? And if you try to do this, you run into all sorts of issues because you have to think about generating structures from, from some sort of string language in a spin and oxidation state dependent manner. There are no general purpose force field and semi-empirical methods that actually work in open shell transition metals where there are multiple accessible spin and oxidation states. The types of databases we have accessible to us are crystallized structures that have been uh, the focus of a lot of experimental study. They're not a good hypothetical space. And the algorithms that work for molecular similarity estimation fail routinely for this uh, type of space. The complexes that behave the most similar to each other cannot be well represented by just looking at the molecular graphs. Um, so that's where we started, but we didn't give up hope. We instead took a divide and conquer approach, realizing that if what I wanted to do was bring to bear high throughput screening and discovery in transition metal chemistry, that an awful large part of that porphyrin is organic bonds, and a very small part of it is a metal organic bond. And so these are from a recent um, perspective I wrote. This is to scale uh, organic bonding, so a, a triple bond, double bond, aromatic bond, single bond. And these are um, also to scale different bond lengths, but the same, the same dimensions. The metal ligand bond for an iron hexacarbonyl complex, just changing the spin and 
oxidation state. So you can see you see a very nice linear progression that jives very well with our concepts of bond order. But then if you go to the iron hexacarbonyl um, complex and you're just looking at the iron carbon bond, you see as much variation, but all you're doing is changing the spin and oxidation state. And as a result, all of our molecular graphs, all of our representations of this complex are exactly identical. So we have no language to describe this. Um, and so as a result, what we did was we took the force field everywhere we could trust the force field, combined that with, a dat at first, in our first generation, a database approach of DFT results, because our goal ultimately was to accelerate DFT calculations, these complexes that are quite time consuming, and basically start uh, DFT geometry optimization at the end, automate the command line high throughput screening of transition metal complexes in a way that wasn't possible before. Along the way, we also did a number of things including um, uh, uh, searching through organic ligands to identify similar and dissimilar cases. And all of this is in our open source code, MolSimplify, which is on Conda and GitHub. And everything I will tell you about today is in MolSimplify. Um, but this is where we were sort of 2014, 2015. We were not at all in machine learning, but what we wanted was we wanted a language for open shell transition metal complexes to assemble them like Legos. We wanted uh, some general way to assign bond lengths that a force field couldn't assign. So this red dot here is the only thing a force field would be able to assign in these types of complexes. And um, we wanted to enable the accelerated discovery of new complexes to solve energy and materials problems. Um, and that's what we went about and did at first. So we applied these tools to challenges in, in functional materials design and catalysis. And what we did, what I like to say now that we did at this point, was we explored uh, chemical space neighborhoods. So this is probably most similar to some of the things Julia was talking about yesterday. But how do you go out and explore hundreds of catalysts in a routine way? This turned out to be something we could do as long as we were patient for the DFT calculations. And I'm not going to tell you more about that today. but um, we wanted to get sort of bigger and away from that. And the realization is, um, and this is just a reminder of what these things look like if you're not from a field where you're used to thinking about them, is transition metal complexes are larger on average than organic molecules. They have variable spin, coordination, and bonding, oxidation state, and so on. And so the space of all theoretical transition metal complexes readily dwarfs the kind of spaces people quote when, we th when they think about organic molecules. You're just adding a whole bunch of knobs to think about. Um, so most of my talk today will be about mid-row, first-row transition metals. We've since extended that, but I'll only be telling you about published work today. Um, and so for instance, if you just pick iron, iron is one of the most earth abundant transition metals. It's the metal sitting in the center of all of our hemoglobins, allowing us to breathe oxygen. Uh, iron can access many possible oxidation states, which in turn leads to many possible quantum mechanical spin states and electron configurations and so on. Um, and then the types of coordination environments and size of ligands is much larger. So many ligands here are larger than, the, um, than some of the larger largest molecules in size constrained enumerated databases such as the GDB. Um, so you can really quickly conclude that while we had this high throughput tool that guessed DFT geometries and got us to the end of nearly the end of where we would want to be for doing high throughput in organic screening, that just doing a lot of DFT calculations wasn't going to be enough. And so that's how um, we came into thinking about how could we use and augment, um, how could we augment our high throughput physics-based approach with machine learning models. Um, and so the the reason that I spend uh, you know, five to 10 minutes on that preamble is because our motivations for getting into machine learning were very directed and very um, away from what most of the community is thinking about, where the community is thinking about, can we build the best uh, neural network potential? Can we, can we do this or that? How do we do on organic chemistry? How do we do on closed shell systems? The, the minute that you introduce variable spin and oxidation state, um, as well as the size of the systems we think about, our priorities uh, are, are dramatically shifted. So, um, so we first got into thinking about how we were going to train machine learning models to augment our software in uh, early 2016. 
Um, and my student came to me, um, and you know, this is starting to get a long time ago now because he's graduating in a couple months, but he was a first year student at the time. And he said, uh, what do you want me to build a machine learning model to predict? And maybe because I'd spent the first 10 years of, of my career working on making density functional theory more accurate for transition metal chemistry, I decided to give him a really, really high, a high bar to, to match, and, and lucky for me that uh, he uh, met and exceeded those expectations. So I wanted to predict the quantum mechanical ground state spin of a transition metal complex, as well as the splitting between that state and a state with a different electron configuration. This is not anything for which any um, decent general empirical heuristic model existed. There are simple theories, but there's nothing that would work across this range of periodic table, nothing that preceded it. There was no physics-based model for us to uh, improve upon. In fact, even the DFT training data that we were going to, to use, I didn't actually trust, and so I wanted him to also predict how sensitive our predictions were to the choice of exchange correlation functional we had used. Then naturally we moved on to predicting other things. The key point here is that we wanted a geometry free representation because we actually wanted to predict the metal organic bond length because this is also something I told you there was no force field or semi empirical theory that could give us this bond length as well as a series of, of other properties such as um, frontier orbital energies, reaction uh, redox and ionization potential, catalyst reaction energetics and so on and so we, we've gone on a few years later to do all of that, uh, but obviously a little different than the primary goals for most of the community. Um, and so uh, the data sets we work with are octahedral mononuclear transition metal complexes. We start with a series of common ligands. Uh, we work typically with plus two and plus three oxidation states with, of metals in at least two spin states, sometimes more. Um, and we address, at least preliminarily, the question of uncertainty in the electronic structure calculus. Uh, with uh, uh, training on an ensemble of functionals. Um, so the, the debate has, has already been brought up about whether or not um, there is actually a trade-off in, in terms of, say, model complexity and interpretability and, and so on. What I'd say is my feeling is that there's no right answer uh, to any of these, but there are constraints. And so the optimal solution is, is sensitive to the constraints you have. And so just a reminder, what we wanted to do was build models that could accelerate discovery in open shell transition metal chemistry. Um, and the the distinct choices we were motivated to make were to think about how are we going to represent our transition metal complex uh, to a machine learning model. Um, and could that representation aid interpretability? So I'll spend most of uh, the part of my talk telling you a little bit about how we, we did that. But um, the natural thing to think about is represent all information about all the atoms and all of their positions, as well as uh, their identities. That's what we do when we set up a DFT calculation that I spent most of the first 10 years of my career working on. But it turns out in open shell transition metal chemistry, there are concepts such as ligand field theory where all you need to know is the metal and its direct coordinating atoms. And once you know that, uh, then you know pretty much everything. Um, so uh, this comes into the question of how much domain knowledge do you give a model? And, um, and so do we want the model to only know this or do we want the model to only know this? In practice, what we know is probably the right answer is something in the middle. Um, similarly, other constraints are to think about the fact that the smallest non-trivial octahedral transition metal complex has between 7 and 13 heavy atoms and at least 100 electrons. So these are not fast calculations. If our only data training point is a geometry optimized transition metal complex, then the result is that we're not going to have nearly the data set sizes that most people doing deep learning are able to. And that's why you'll see most of the models um, that I show you today are not, uh, do not have tons of layers and, and so on. Um, and so I hope I will also show you that uh, we focus on a balance between interpretability, the ability to extrapolate and discover, uh, but as well as the fact that we don't aim for accuracy better than our training data, and our training data is DFT in an extremely difficult space for density functional theory. Uh, so this is a space where it's not uncommon to see errors as much as 10 times larger than they would be in organic chemistry. 
OK, so um, we actually ended up doing this two ways when we wanted to build machine learning models for transition metal chemistry. And I'm going to show you both at the same time. Uh, we've gone on to use both of our approaches. Um, but the first way we did it is, as I mentioned, my student was asking me, what do you want to be able to learn? And I was very confident in my domain knowledge at the time. Um, so I thought, well, obviously the metal matters. Coordinating atoms matter. That's what crystal field theory tells us. Um, and then let's think about properties around the metal. We'd actually figured this out through physics. And these types of things actually crop up a lot in material science heuristic data sets uh, or feature sets that people use in solid state material science as well. Um, uh, but this actually came from work we had done in density functional theory development, specifically thinking about rigidity and especially differences in electronegativity of atoms around the metal center. Um, and then we borrowed something from the cheminformatics li literature, the truncated cure shape index. Um, and all of this was heavily weighted towards what's going on directly at the metal. Um, and we retrospectively called this MCDL25. It's a rather uh, limited, sparse uh, feature set and it's really heavily engineered. It's what I thought was the right answer, give or take a couple of things. Um, but there were other things that, you know, when people are focused on atomization energies, uh, things like the number of atoms in the system matter a lot. And so there were things that we'd essentially thrown out with this representation. It was very ad hoc, and we wanted to go back and fill in the gap. Um, and think about how we could do this more systematically. So the way we ended up doing this was we revived uh, something from the 1980s, moreau brodo autocorrelation functions. These are discrete products and differences on the molecular graph of heuristic properties. So you can think of them as very similar to graph convolutions. Um, but what they do is they take that out of the model. And so as a result, these are features that can be used to train a wide range of models, including simple things like kernel ridge regression models. So revised autocorrelations are, again, this is practically my only slide with an equation on it. So for this audience, I'm, I'm going to go, go slowly, even though I still have a few slides left. Um, uh, so it's a heuristic property we chose from a lookup table. We chose at the beginning five simple heuristic properties. Um, and some of these came from Moro and Brodo, and some of these came from our interest. These are specifically the nuclear charge, the electronegativity chi, the covalent radius, the the topology, which is how many atoms the other atom is connected to, and the identity, just the number one. And so um, the way we changed this from what was already there in the 1980s is we adapted it for open shell transition metal chemistry and adjusted these scum sums so that they could be focused on a ligand coordinating atom or metal coordinating atom and always include information about the metal and the correlation. Um, we have an adjustable depth here. This is depth in terms of bonds. So this is inherently still only a geometry-free uh, topological representation. And uh, the depth cutoff we used in practice in this work was we looked at um, QM9 data and whether or not we could systematically improve if we kept extend extending this depth out. And it turned out we ended up with um, best performance when we truncate depth at three. The key technical detail here to realize is that because many of these products and differences are over the whole, uh, the whole molecule, all this means is that atoms that are more than three bond paths apart don't tend to be correlated in specific types of rep representation features. Um, and so if you do this, you end up with things that span from local to global, just based on how you cut off the depth and how you choose the scope and so on. So uh, the number of atoms in a system is just the zero depth identity in a rack. Um, these local descriptors are the zero depth ligand centered and metal centered Z. Um, these other ones also show up. And in terms of interpretability, I was told not to worry about it, but interpretability is in the title of the of this workshop. So um, we've actually found using this to be extremely important and valuable in terms of aiding interpretation of data sets and ML models. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to color uh, Z and Chi as electronic features. I'm calling them electronic, but they're still just heuristic. They're not coming from a, a calculation of any kind. Or more geometric in nature, this is topology or identity. Um, 
And then if information about the molecule that's distant from the metal is, um, is incorporated in a feature that gets selected, I'm going to call that a distal feature. If it's only metal-centered, I'm going to call it proximal. Um, and so principal component analysis of the property we want to learn, spin splitting, um, uh, so this is color by spin splitting or color by size, tells us why, um, why we needed a local representation. So if we use a whole molecule representation and, and uh, do a PCA in that representation of our data, what we see is we get molecules that are very different in size, being well separated in a whole molecule representation. Uh, but the, the property that we want to predict turns out to be extremely similar for these complexes because, uh, because transition metal chemistry doesn't actually care about what's going on down here. So these two properties we want to predict, we would like them to be closer. And so if you do a PCA in one of our local representations, you end up with two points um, now much closer together. Now, if we had millions of data points of these transition metal complexes, maybe we wouldn't care. We'd have the patience for the model to learn that these two molecules actually behave identically. Uh, but by choosing um, a representation that made more sense, we were able to cut down um, in the initial work on the, the effort that a model had to learn on a relatively small data set. And so this is, this is a spectrochemical series, specifically the DFT spectrochemical series. And the first time we did this with ad hoc representations, um, our MCDL25, the neural net could predict 97% of uh, DFT spin states correctly. Um, the thing I should point out here is that these black error bars are something called Monte Carlo dropout. Maybe some of you have used it. Um, we were interested from the very beginning, especially given that our data set sizes were so small and trying to quantify the uncertainty in our models. I'll tell you in a little bit why we moved away uh, from Monte Carlo dropout, but that just involves uh, having a rigorous basis, if you haven't thought about it much, for credible intervals based on zeroing out nodes. It's uh, close in spirit to ensemble models, which are I will also talk about in my talk. Um, and so uh, this is certainly not uh, overly impressive. We're the only people building these models. So relatively speaking, at the time, it was state of the art because it was the best we'd done so far. But we were an order of magnitude better on the same data set size just by choosing a more reasonable representation for transition metal complexes. Um, and so this is about the only performance plots I'll have, but I think this is an interesting question I, I, to, to bring up. I told you that we did this twice. So we did the representation that was my idea as the domain expert of what matters for transition metal chemistry. And then we developed a more systematic approach that could expand and include those features that I had selected, but also included um, other features that I wouldn't have known about. Um, and what you can see is that the you can do about uh, sub kilocal per mole accuracy on predicting the quantum mechanical ground state spin with the improved features. It's basically uh, a reduction, a, a significant reduction in error from what my ad hoc representation had been. Um, and you might think that's just because of the reduction in, or the increase in number of dimensions, so we're able to fit the data better. Um, but it, it turns out that if you apply feature selection and identify the most essential features, you can get the, the uh, feature set down to about the same dimension as MCDL25 was without loss in accuracy. Um, and this is just a set I'm calling universal here that we use a lot because we uh, concluded that it could perform equally well across a range of properties. So this also worked for redox and ionization potential. Um, here is, is uh, both redox and IP on the same plot. And one thing that was interesting about this is for ionization potential, I'm predicting the adiabatic gas phase ionization potential, whereas redox is the solvent and thermocorrected value. Um, it wasn't any harder to learn the redox than it was to learn the IP. Um, and this sort of started to get boring after we could do a certain number of, of properties. Um, but one thing that I'll point out is that, yes, we're not building a neural net potential. Um, but what we were able to do was overcome limitations of prior uh, force fields that we might have used to predict the metal ligand bond. Um, so in particular here, um, this is what we would have been able to do with something called the universal force field just to predict the metal ligand bond length. I already hinted at this. If we use our neural net trained to predict the metal ligand bond length from composition, 
we get an error now of 0.01 angstroms. And because we're trying to build things that we can then plug into carrying out a DFT geometry optimization, this amounts to um, starting a structure at the optimized value. And this overcomes something. There had been a, a fairly wide uh, range of developments in, in the force field and semi-empirical community. And most physics-based models still would not be able to predict these bond lengths, regardless of the, the method that had been developed. Um, so I guess a question would be is how do we start to analyze the feature sets? What's the difference between me as, as a domain expert and what I came up with for a feature set and what you see in terms of these, these ones that we carried out statistical feature selection on? Um, and so this is what MCDL25 looks like. Uh, red here is the proximal wedge near the metal. Middle is the green and distal is the small fraction. So it, exactly in words what I just told you, which is that um, an extremely metal-centered feature set um, is what I thought the right answer was. By definition of the expansion, I showed you racks are extremely uh, metal distal in nature, um, just because that's how the sums and products and differences work out. And then if we look at one of these universally selected feature sets, you can see that we end up basically at the same spot that we did with MCDL25. Now, why is the spin splitting energy two and a half kilocals per mole with MCDL25 versus um, versus one kilocal per mole with the, with the systematic feature set. Well, some of that is the difference uh, can certainly be preliminarily attributed to the difference in the balance between intermediate and metal local. Um, so you can see what we got right was that metal distant features could easily be thrown out. Information far away um, just makes it harder for the model to generalize. Um, and that metal local features were really important and needed. But what we were going to do with things that were in between those two limits, I didn't actually know. Right? So we had ideas, but we didn't know. And so that I would ultimately attribute to what this difference is. Um, but I did want to get back to this question of the porphyrin and say that we spent a lot of time looking at uh, feature analysis and feature selection as a way um, to think about feature importance. The first time we did this, we just used um, random forest feature importance. I think in our more recent papers, we primarily uh, use random forest to rank order the features and then use that uh, to carry out a, um, recursive feature addition in a KRR model uh, to be a little bit more robust um, and avoid some of the limitations of random forest. Um, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to the racks. Um, and from the 155 possible racks, I'm going to analyze what are the most essential features to predict per certain properties. And, and to me, um, I think this is one of the most important things we can deliver when we think about machine learning models and data analysis is can we actually interpret and think about um, think about data sets in a new way. Rather than just making a faster prediction or a bigger prediction, can we actually um, think about physics-based rules that we already knew, but in a, in a different way? And so um, I'm going to make the atoms large if they're important and small if they're not. Um, so this is spin splitting. And what the top of this plot shows you, this is just a 41. This is a higher error cutoff on the random forest versus the 26 subset, which I was calling URAC 26. What this plot tells you is that ligand field theory works. It tells you the same things I already told you. And if I showed this to an inorganic chemist, they would say, of course. So what this is telling you is that the electronic properties of the atoms around the metal most strongly determine the spin. Um, and then the atoms further away, they matter a lot less. And it might matter more how branched they are and how big they are and so on. Um, if you go to something like bond length, it gets interesting because the property balance is totally different. Uh, so this is shown on a porphyrin, but it's an abstraction of the whole data set. We've developed, um, I think, what Julia referred to as, as single molecule uh, sensitivities. But I'm not going to tell you anything about that today. So bond length is an overall um, and mixed property. And you can think of this uh, very intuitively once, once someone has told you that, because you can think about the atoms participating in the metal ligand bond. Their chemistry determines how strong that bond is. But if you have things pulling on that bond partner, then those are going to, um, those are going to affect it just as much. And that's why you see atoms further out playing a larger role in the, in the selected features. 
But then where it gets really interesting is that if you think about something like redox, a whole different part of the molecule lights up. So this suggests that there should be a way to tune the redox potential of a molecule without touching the spin, or tune the spin without ever touching the redox potential. And so this not just gives us a roadmap to faster predictions, uh, predicting a DFT result in a second instead of hours, that's fine. Maybe, you know, maybe that, that's a lofty enough goal, but this gives us a roadmap to design. Um, and so uh, if you want to get more quantitative about it, um, and rather than just pretty pictures, this is what these specific pie charts are, and this is how the racks get picked up. So these are the four all together. Um, just in pie chart form, the main thing to note is that in the pie chart form, metal local is, is blue, then goes out more non-local red, green, orange, until global with gray. Um, and global are whole molecule properties. Um, and so this is what this orthogonal design path looks like. So if you wanted to change uh, the redox potential of this manganese complex without changing its preference for spin substantially, you can do that just by changing the ligand size. So that's exactly what the map told us. Uh, if you want to change the, the spin state ordering of these carbonyl complexes, we can go from iron to manganese here. And you can see we don't change the redox potential because it's the ligand determining the redox potential. It's not the metal any longer longer, and so on. So all of these paths we can walk through with discrete molecules that match against what these abstractions of the feature selection process told us. Um, and then as a chemical engineer, I'm fully obligated to talk a little bit about catalysis and to say, um, how would you do this? How would you accelerate uh, the screening um, without machine learning? And there are lots of really creative ways chemical engineers do this. And one is the so-called descriptor-based approach. And a descriptor-based approach says everything we know about why a catalyst works can be broken down into some one property. And frequently, these properties are things like the highest occupied molecular orbital. And so I'm just going to show you briefly something we did recently where you think about um, if you want to form a metal oxo intermediate, these metal oxo intermediates are the most uh, powerful um, uh, sort of selective catalyst known to man. They're in biology and in materials and so on. And so you can say, well, I'm going from iron 2 to iron 4 oxo here. The, the highest occupied molecular orbital of this iron 2 has to be uh, the most important descriptor. And so if you generate a large enough data set, what you quickly conclude is that you would expect a straight line here between the oxo formation energy and the homo descriptor, but you just get a blob. And so the same analysis we had done can be used to explain that, uh, yes, in fact, if you take a look at it, the, the model and the feature selection trained to predict the oxo formation energy, which we could now do independently from predicting this homo level, they have extremely distinct features. And so you can see that there are limits to trying to assume that a simple linear correlation would apply across a wide design space between two properties. Um, and this general approach is something that, that we uh, then generalized. And so we now have maps of all sorts of properties we might care about in transition metal complexes in terms of these rack representations. Uh, but I guess I'll get into some more technical details and, and where we're going um, in a little bit. Um, but just to say that something I've obviously swept under the rug, uh, which you may or may not know since there aren't many um, electronic structure folks here, is that there's a great deal of uncertainty in the method that we choose for our training data. Um, Andrew's talk touched on some of the issues with, with density functional theory pretty well. Um, but the scale at which we now care about um, uncertainty is if I imagine a large space I'm trying to explore with my machine learning model, I want to imagine that there's a class of complexes sitting over here, a class of complexes sitting over here, and I think that all of those complexes are great. They're wonderful materials. But it turns out that at least some of them I only think are great because of the level of theory on which the model was trained. And that's a fundamental limitation in the things we think about. Um, but we've started to address them in a very simple way by just recalling that uh, we train on a series of functionals. So we can dial in what functional our model is supposed to be predicting on, 
and this is a TSNI plot here, we can look at how lead points appear or disappear on this TSNI based on the functional that we use, and we can easily rationalize this. So some points are method insensitive. They would be lead molecules that would save the world, regardless of the functional that we use. Others are going to move around in a way that can also be interpreted. Um, so I'm not going to say too much more about that. Um, but what I wanted to do next, once we had machine learning models, besides just interpreting and coming up with design rules, was to be able to, to carry out discovery. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do was we wanted machine learning models that could um, predict what the best lead molecules were uh, for subsequent DFT follow-up or maybe characterization by an experimentalist. And the first time we tried to do this was I just told my student, I said, let's just pull 35 molecules from the Cambridge Structural Database. They're totally different from anything we've trained on. Um, and this was back when we were still using MCDL25. And this is how we did. So we did pretty terribly. These are errors in kilocalpermol. We only did maybe acceptably for about 40% um, of the data set. So recall I said we were trying to quantify our uncertainty here. Um, and so uh, we could go back and look at, uh, look at what uh, the Monte Carlo dropout intervals were. So that's what these error bars are from. Um, and these Monte Carlo intervals are overconfident. So I cannot use them in any way to tell me why some points lie close to the line and others lie further away. Um, so we went back to the drawing board and we asked ourselves, what else could we do? And, and so could we, by eye, see why we did so well on some molecules and poorly on others? And the conclusion was that um, that the ones that we were doing well on looked pretty similar to training data. And what I'm showing here is the Euclidean norm distance in the MCDL25 feature set. Then um, these larger distance molecules are the ones we were doing poorly on. So we could reach a conclusion that a good heuristic might be in the normalized Euclidean norm distance in the highly feature engineered MCDL25 feature set that we would probably do a pretty decent job of, of getting rid of these higher points. Um, and so that's what we did. So if we cut off and say the model should only predict to, on things that are moderately distant from which it was trained in the feature space, uh, then we could throw away almost all of the bad points and keep almost all of the good points. And so the result was even in a case where we were doing terribly, our error was 10 kilocals per mole versus about 2.5 kilocal per mole on test because we were really pushing a model where we didn't have data. We got ourselves down to about 5 kilocals per mole on the molecules we were willing to predict on. So we've since gone back and done this a couple of other ways. But just to say that this was a clear case where, um, where certain types of uncertainty quantification that have been motivated in the community were clearly overconfident and something more chemically motivated was needed. Um, so once we had uh once we had a metric in hand to know where, where our model would be uncertain combined with, um, combined with uh, models that were trained to predict properties, what we did was we, we took a pretty simple approach. We've since gone beyond in the framework of uh, efficient global optimization, but I'm only going to tell you about this older work today. Um, and that's to say is what we did was we combined uh, evolutionary algorithms with the ML predictions and used the quantified uncertainty to guide where the ML model should go. We did this on larger design spaces. So instead of the high throughput screening of 500 leads, we at least moved up to thousands. And because we had models that could predict ground state uh, quantum mechanical spin, what we wanted to do was find what we call spin crossover complexes. These are functional materials that can change their spin state in response to light, temperature, and small molecules. As a result, they change their optical and mechanical properties. Um, so since this was a genetic algorithm, this is, this is what our genes look like. And this is just a cartoon of how these things work. Um, and so with the neural net, we could do this type of, we could do a single generation in seconds instead of what we would normally do uh, with DFT, which would take days to months. Um, and, but we wanted to do this in a way where um, there was awareness of uncertainty. Um, and so we used a composite fitness function of spin state ordering uh, in this particular case, as well as distance to the data. Well, the first time we did this, we used feature space distances. I will show you some other examples where we used a more sophisticated uncertainty quantification at the end. Quick question. Yeah. Design space here is only thousands of molecules. 
in this particular toy application because we wanted to easily enumerate and visualize the space. Our current application spaces are a few million. But that's still, I mean, a few million is still well in what you can enumerate and run all your models on. But our goal here was to also compare side by side against DFT. Um, and so 5,000 5, molecules with DFT takes about seven years. It's not that much. <laughs> CPU years, it's not that much. I assume that's the unit you're using. Right? Yeah, I, I'm actually using GPU years, and CPU years it would take longer. This is a toy problem. This space in particular was a demonstration of the approach. So our goal here was not, um, so there are issues. So there are issues that, that featurizing all of the molecules and storing them, we do start to hit when we get on the few million molecule space. But these days, that's the spaces that we do them on this, this year. So I should point out, since, since he put down my design space, this, this work was a high school student summer project, Lydia Chan. She's an undergrad at Stanford now. And um, we didn't have seven years to wait for her to finish her high school project. So, um, so in any case, um, the, the point was we could get leads in, in seconds with, with the neural net. Um, we didn't actually have to use the GA, but what we were working towards was a paradigm of switching between the ML predictions and the DFT predictions, as well as benchmarking the two side by side. Um, and so we did want to keep the design space modest here. And so what you can see is that we were able to control uncertainty while not reducing fitness. Um, but you might ask, how did we do? Um, and we didn't do that great. So um, about two thirds of the, the molecules were confirmed spin crossover complexes. And part of that is the fact that the definition of spin crossover complex was really close to our test error. But also we made this hard on ourselves because uh, if we wanted to actually probably get all of them to be spin crossover complexes, we would have started them in the middle at zero. Um, and so it didn't necessarily mean that, that we had monotonic dependence on how far or close this, this Euclidean norm distance was. Um, the complexes we did really poorly on were just completely absent uh, from our data set. So these are almost all heteroleptic manganese complexes that exhibit strong Jan Teller distortion. And in our preliminary data set, we had homoleptic complexes that when you average them, they behaved entirely differently. So there was no way for the model to know that these complexes were far or that their chemistry was different. Um, and that's a good example of one. And overall, what we're able to do with this approach was keep our uh, discovery error pretty close to the baseline test error. And so even though some of these didn't, weren't confirmed leads, the enrichment in the space was about a couple orders of magnitude. So if we had enumerated all of these with DFT, we would have gotten uh, less than 100th of the confirmed leads we got through this uh, combined approach. Um, and so we went on to use this for other, other cases. Um, so we've used this in catalysis and in predicting uh, band gaps. So as I mentioned, and as I usually like to say, we moved up to thousands and thousands of complexes and pretty trivially now could control the error of our neural net when we confirm uh, with DFT by balancing how much exploration we were willing to do against how much the, the model knew. So both of these use the uncertainty quantification metric I'll get to. Um, now. And so um, when we were using a heavily feature engineered set like MCDL25, the feature space distance worked really well. Um, but what we wanted to do was work more generally in a way that we thought would be useful. So we went back to this question of uncertainty. Um, and we thought about what neural nets are generally doing um, and the fact that the feature space distance, if the neural net is doing anything, is not, not particularly helpful. What we actually want to look at is the distance in the last layer of the, of the network in the latent space. We'd already had significant experience with Monte Carlo dropout and there was a lot of interest or there's continued interest in, in um, ensemble models, so training on uh, training slightly different data sets of models and looking at where they diverge. The problem with ensemble models is that they can tend to be overconfident when, uh, when far enough from data, especially um, 
well regularized models and then we I'd already shown you that for us Monte Carlo dropout was too overconfident and so what we wanted to look at was the latent space distance and we went back and we had more data now and, and bigger data sets and we wanted to look at um, another pull of the Cambridge Structural Database of distinct molecules this is a principal component analysis all the gray boxes here indicate um, uh, where we had data in our data sets. All of these uh, colored dots are colored by the feature space distance in racks, as well as, um, as, well as sitting completely outside of, um, you can also see that, the, that even there are some high distance points that sit inside the convex hull and there are other high distance points that sit outside. The main thing to note, if you don't think about transition metal chemistry very often, is that there are a lot of elements in this data set that just aren't in any of our training data. So there are both metals and coordinating atoms that just were never in our training data, things like arsenic, things like uh, certain sulfur coordinating ligands, and so on. And so this is really, um, this is pretty much as extrapolative as you can get in terms of computational chemistry for those of you not used to thinking about these types of molecules. The diversity in our molecules is also much larger than in any other chemical sets. And so by design, we generated a lot of high error points. Um, and the training error was quite low. We had enough data, but the, um, but the tail of high error points was really high. And so what we'd like to know is we'd like a clean division between these low error cases that we're actually able to predict and these high error cases. Um, because we didn't want to go around actually generating uh, all of these data points would take would take months and years and we don't want to do that we just want to apply the neural network where we know we can trust it um, and so this is how we did um, this is the latent space distance model and these are the Monte Carlo dropout and ensemble uh, models so what I'm showing here is the percentage captured in the first standard deviation second and completely outliers so Monte Carlo dropout does what I already told you it did. Um, it is way too overconfident. Um, but ensemble models essentially do the same thing. They are a little better, but they're, they're not. Um, they're, they're still missing a fair amount of higher points. And then the latent space distance works easily as well as these other two. And then because it comes directly from the model, it doesn't require multiple model retraining. And so it's compatible with more complex architectures than the ones I'm showing you. Are your ensemble subsets of the data or different hyperparameters? Subsets of the data. Monte Carlo dropouts, more like a. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I just mean it in the standard way, chemists. We were trying to do what everyone normally does in the chemistry community. So, um, so this is just what we can do now. So this is uh, scaling ourselves to be more conservative based on the latent space distance and monotonically driving down error. Green is the points we choose to make the prediction on. Orange is the points that we choose not to make the prediction on. You can see we're moving more and more conservatively and predicting on less and less data, but we can drive ourselves back to the train error. Um, same thing goes for organic uh, molecules. So I put this in here because I know most people tend to care a lot more about organic molecules than I do. So this is autocorrelations, uh, so geometry free with a residual net architecture um, to predict uh, atomization energies from QM9 data. It's intentionally um, trained on only about 5,000 of the points in QM9. And so it's not state of the art by any means. Um, it's designed to have enough molecules sitting in the rest of QM9 uh, to be diverse enough that we can um, that we can actually create large enough errors and then monotonically drive them down. And you can see the same smooth behavior. Um, in the SI of this paper, we also demonstrated it on um, MNIST and FMNIST, and uh, it also turns out it's pretty good for adversarial detection. But then we realized that once we got into that. Um, that area that a lot of people were trying similar things. And so really what we've done is uh, managed to come up with something that works really well for small, modest chemistry data sets that um, are similar to concepts people have been working with. Um, but also to say uh, it worked pretty well on our uh, active, as an active learning uh, guide. So using the 116 points, taking out the 10 points that are suggested by latent distance, 10, uh, the ensemble or Monte Carlo dropout, and then using them to retrain. You can see you get a benefit just from removing them, but you get the best retrain out of the latent space distance. 
Um, so just to say there are many ways to do uncertainty quantification. Um, all of them probably depend on the application, but we found one that we were pretty happy with. Um, so coming back to this question, and I ran a little slow and didn't get to the thing that I thought everyone would be excited about, so maybe I'll skip through this pretty quickly. One thing that we tried to do was overcome the fact that we're so extremely data poor in, in comparison to everyone else, is to systematically come up with enumerative strategies for small transition mount complexes. And the rules there differ dramatically from what people did when they put together the GDB. Uh, we generate a series of distinct molecules, and what was maybe the most interesting about that is because we enumerated and generated complexes with very distinct coordination geometry around the metal, and that's one of the most important uh, details. Um, we ended up actually being able to systematically drive down the errors in a different way. So one way we drove down errors on the CSD data set was to avoid predictions where uncertainty was high. The other way was we were able to balance out the data um, by generating more coordination environments we'd never seen before. Um, so I'd, I'd like to finish, although I ran a little long, I'd like to finish with something that my group's been working on, and it's thinking about, as computational chemists, we do a lot of things that amount to running a lot of DFT calculations and making decisions about what method to use, uh, how to check on the calculation, um, and, and we usually consult a lot of papers, and in transition metal chemistry, all of these different steps are really hard. I spent basically five years of my PhD running through this workflow over and over again. Um, and so what we've been working on is thinking about how do we make all of this process autonomous so that we have decision models and classifiers that can make these choices for us when we set out to have a design objective. Um, we've already naturally done a lot of this calculation automation as well as the data-driven models and automated analysis. Um, I'm we're working on this, and I think we have exciting results that are going to come out soon. Uh, but I'm only going to tell you about one piece today, which is how do you decide sight unseen? How does a computational model decide if a calculation should actually be carried out? So should the physics model simulation be carried out in the context of uh, accelerated discovery? Um, and so in inorganic chemistry, a good way to design, define success and failure is did the molecule you wanted to simulate stay together, or did it fall apart? Um, and this over here is just details of what's going on with the electronic structure and is a single reference method sufficient. Um, and so what we did was we went back and used racks and trained on 3,000 good and bad calculations. And it turned out we could predict based on chemical composition alone, would a calculation succeed? Um, and the result is that if we applied that to the design space, because so many calculations in transition metal chemistry fail, uh, we could carry out about half of the calculations in about a third of the time because failed calculations take longer and get about 88% of the chemical space that we needed to get. Um, but if you actually look at if this is transferable, the answer is no. So you need to know something about why calculations succeed or fail, and just a composition-only approach doesn't tend to work. Um, so we introduced another classifier-specific um, uncertainty quantification metric, and the result was that if we only predicted on the most confident points when we moved to a diverse data set, was that we could actually get back to this accuracy. But you note that this accuracy is not particularly impressive. We're still leaving behind cases where we uh, cases where we thought we should be able to get the right answer, and we never really exceed about 88% success rate. So what we realize is that if we're going to have to do some of these calculations, we can monitor very easily things that are going on related to the wave function and the geometry, related to bond order around the metal, charges on the metal, gradient, um, and geometry, and so on. Um, and there we trained a convolutional neural network on these around 34 properties using time series data. You might ask, why didn't we use a recurrent neural net? It was a pain in the butt to train. Um, and this turns out to work, which I'm going to show you in about five seconds. And so this generalizes now to diverse data. So the diverse data we were only doing about 61% on. We can actually, with the latent space entropy uncertainty quantification, uh, we can wait until we have enough time step information to make the prediction. Um, and we can get to about 100% accuracy. So we can exceed the best that we were doing in terms of composition only. Um, and it takes time. So it takes a certain number of steps before the model is confident enough to make a prediction on diverse data that's very different from what it was trained on. Um, so how do we interpret this model? Uh, we used gradient weighted class activation map to distinguish the, the features that were essential in the model classification. Here it's just the time series data of electronic 
economic and geometric descriptors of what's going on during the geometry optimization. The focus of the gradient weighted class activation map is high when it's green here, and these are just scaled information about the features as they're varying. And so here are four uh, grad cam analyses uh, for four different types of geometry optimizations. Um, so in some cases, things work out well, and this happens quickly. Uh, in other cases, we can have wiggles that occur quickly, and then the calculation goes bad quickly. In other cases, um, the fact that the calculation ends up working out occurs slowly, um, and so the model knows to focus on the end of the simulation. Whereas other cases, uh, what goes bad uh, happens slowly and also it needs to focus on the later parts. So this explains why a composition only prediction of whether or not the calculation will succeed or fail um, tended to not be able to exceed this 88% ceiling. We weren't able with any model or um, any method to get better than that because path dependent information is essential to determining why one calculation succeeds or another fails. The next steps in doing this are to do uh, control theory type approaches to start to use this information to actually modify the calculation so we can turn failures into successes. Um, so just to conclude, uh, we started in thinking about high throughput open shell transition metal chemistry. This naturally led us into thinking about machine learning model prediction. Um, this allowed us to start to carry out accelerated discovery of new molecules. Um, and where we're going now is making this whole process fully autonomous. So, um, and all of the models, including calculation success, are in our code. Um, I'd like to conclude by acknowledging the, the students who did the work and the funding sources. Um, uh, Mole Simplify was started by, uh, by Tim Ianidis, my first student, and the machine learning work was pioneered by John Paul Genet. Broadly, this effort is carried out by this part of my group. And then I had the chance to show you some of Chen Ruduan and Aditya Nani's work today. Um, so thank you for your patience.